God's Word. Tonight I will be reading the same passage of Scripture I did two Sunday nights ago. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we will read verse number 34. Jesus is speaking here in this verse. He says, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Would you lift your hands toward heaven right now and let's pray for his anointing upon this message. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you tonight. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your anointing. And Father, we pray that through this message tonight, Lord, as we study your word about this end time generation, God, that you would open up our hearts and our minds, Lord, open up our, our, our soul to hear your word, Lord, to hear the truth of your word. And Father, we pray that you will draw us close to you, Lord, as we prepare Prepare our hearts for your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Two Sunday nights ago, I began a series of messages entitled The End Time Generation. And to bring you up to date from where we left off two weeks ago, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem. They had been looking at the temple in Jerusalem that had recently been renovated by King Herod the Great. And they were going to cross the Kidron Valley to proceed onward to the Mount of Olives. The disciples were very impressed with what had been taking place in the temple of Jerusalem. And they were impressed with the new additions and the renovations. And they wanted to see what Jesus had to say about the beauty of the temple. And Jesus shocked the disciples with his response. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 through 3, the Bible says, And when Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And the remainder of this chapter we see is the response that Jesus gave to the disciples' question. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, Jesus concludes his statement with this prophecy, saying, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What things is Jesus talking about in this prophecy? 
What does Jesus mean by a generation of time? And, and with that mindset, what should you and I be looking for? What should we be expecting in the days ahead? What are some of the primary keys of Bible prophecy? And when we have an understanding and we see what is taking place in our world today, how then should we live our lives as we expectedly await for the coming of Jesus Christ? So over the course of the next few weeks on Sunday nights, these are some things that we're going to be talking about as Jesus is, is telling us about this end time generation. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus has given us many signs to look for, to know that his coming is near. And when Jesus is talking about the signs of the times, each one of these signs, he only talks about one time. But when Jesus is talking about these signs in Matthew 24, I want you to note and, and listen carefully to how many times Jesus talked about the subject of deception. More than any other subject in Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the subject of deception. In verse 4 and 5, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In verse 11, he says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Again in verse 23 and verse 24, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Four times in these passages of Scripture, we see that Jesus Christ is mentioning the subject of deception in the last days. And among this deception that he is talking about is the deception of believers. There are many believers in the world today many church believers that are being deceived into believing a false message, a false doctrine. Now, I've only been pastor here at Howe Assembly of God for about a year and a half now. And I've been serving in ministry now for a period much longer than that. And, and I am thankful for the Pentecostal heritage that I've been brought up in. And, and many of you here tonight, you have been brought up in a Pentecostal heritage. And some of you, this is the only church that you've ever known in your life. And, and I want you to understand something. In a sense, we are kind of under a rock compared to what is going on in the rest of this church world. In a sense, that is good because we have not been exposed to it, but also it has its negative effect because we must recognize how serious the situation is in the world. And even more serious, we need to recognize the problems that's going on in the church world. Let me explain to you what I mean. I would have never believed it years ago if you would have told me that a pastor would be sipping on beer while he's preaching his message in the pulpit. It's taking place in churches today in a program called Hymns and Beer. I would have never believed it years ago if you told me about a, a church not too far from here in their church auditorium that they have places for cowboys to spit their tobacco juice during the worship service. Let me tell you something, church, it ain't happening here at Howe Assembly of God. Just because a church, just because a pastor, just because some evangelist may be popular and has written many best-selling books or has even preached on television does not mean that he is preaching a sound biblical truth and doctrine of the Word of God. I have heard preachers who I know people that turn out by the thousands to hear them speak and they're wrapped up in their teaching. And I also know that there are some of you here tonight and some that are watching online that, that you listen to these ministers and you subscribe to their mailing, uh, their mailing list and you read their literature and you go to their prophecy conferences. But I want you to understand a lot of these people that you see are preaching a message of a false doctrine that is found nowhere in the Word of God. And it's what is happening today is that we are seeing professing believers and they are accepting some new revelation, even though that uh, begins to conflict with what is written in the, in the revealed Word of God. 
When that happens, it leads to deception. It leads to an opposition to biblical truth within the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Janus was a magician of sorts who withstood Moses and Aaron. He was a kind of individual that when he saw the power of God, he would try to mock it and he would try to imitate it. And we see that taking place a lot of times in the church world today. People are mocking the power of God. They are mocking the gifts of the Spirit. And we see pastors, even in some Pentecostal services, that they are calling people up on the platform to try to have a, a demonstration of the gifts of the Spirit and have a demonstration of a personal prophecy and have a demonstration of a so-called miracle that's going to take place because they want everyone that's in their audience to see what is taking place. Church, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that we are to make an entertainment and a showcase of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the healing power of Jesus Christ. I believe in miracle signs and wonders. But when you use the gifts of the Spirit to gain an increase in finances, when you use the gifts of the Spirit to try to draw in a large crowd, then you're missing the point of the whole church. The whole purpose of the church is not to bring healing to the sick. The whole purpose of the church is not to show miracle signs and wonders, but the purpose of the church is to preach the truth of Jesus Christ, that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life, that no man comes to the Father but by him. Amen. We must proclaim that glorious truth of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. There are many people today that preach a distorted gospel, and they preach a doctrine that, that is not backed up in the Word of God. And many of these people are now finding themselves in, in leadership positions and church denominations and Christian universities. Be careful when you go to college, those of you young people that may be going to college, and, and I've talked to some in other churches that are going to be going to Bible college, be careful where you go. I don't care if it is part of the Assemblies of God. Understand what they are teaching and make sure that everything that is being taught is backed up in the Word of God. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? In Galatians chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. There is only one gospel. There is only one truth truth. There is only one way and Jesus is the way. There is no new revelation that needs to be given to mankind. If it's new, then it is not true. And if it is true, then it is not new. Every time a message in tongues goes forward, it is going to proclaim the truth of God's word. It is going to be a recollection of a biblical truth that has already been brought forth in God's word. God is not going to reveal some new thing. There are people in this world today that claim to have received some new thing. We call them cult groups. We call them cult organizations like the Mormon church, the Muslims. Any other way is not backed up by the scriptures and the word of God. And so the only way that we can be protected from the deception found in this world's influences is to know what the Word of God says for ourselves. It's more than just listening to our Sunday school teacher. I thank God for our Sunday school teachers. We have anointed, spirit-filled Sunday school teachers here at Howe Assembly of God. I wouldn't want it any other way. But it's more than listening to the pastor. It's more than just listening to what someone else is teaching. But we must get into the Word of God for ourselves. We must study the Word of God for 
ourselves. Jesus said, if you continue in my word. In other words, we must study his word. We must obey his word. We must live by his word. Then he says, we are his disciples indeed. And because of that, we will know the truth. And the truth will set us free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We must be aware of what is taking place in this world around us. There are several ways in which Satan, the father of lies, is deceiving people today. And even believers, even people that call themselves Christians are falling for the lies of the enemy. Satan is always telling the same old lies, the same, it's the same thing over and over, trying to destroy people's lives. Have you ever noticed that many of these alleged Christian books and articles and, and many of these evangelists on television have to do with self, promoting yourself? In other words, they're saying that you can be everything that you want to be. You can be a better you. You can live your best life now. You can discover a champion in you. See, the Apostle Paul he had to fight this in Galatia because there were those that taught that the blood of Jesus was not enough to save an individual. They thought that somehow, some way, you had to do something yourself, that you had to work for your salvation. They thought that there was something you had to do, some kind of a work, some kind of a deed that you could do in order to earn your salvation. But when you look at the philosophies and the ideas of this world, it all has to do with one thing, self-righteousness by your own way, by trying to earn your way into salvation. And the Bible makes it clear that salvation is only by faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. Satan also tries to confuse people. He's the author of confusion. There are popular religions. There are even some denominations that, that even hint uh, uh, in, in so-called Christian books that we are going to evolve to become just like a God. Isn't that what Satan told Eve in the Garden of Eden? That she was going to become just like God if she did what he was trying to convince her to do. See, people are letting their standards down. And it's because they have compromised. They no longer live according to the teachings of the forefathers of the church. They no longer live according to what Jesus taught in the word of God. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Here's the answer. Absolutely none whatsoever. No fellowship at all. There is no reason for, for, for people that are on fire, full of the Holy Spirit, to hang out and to associate and to buddy up with people of this world. Why? Because it's so much easier to pull someone down to a lower level than it is to pull someone up to a higher level. Another way that people are deceived today is through false prophets. You know, the world's not short of those today. We see it every time. Turn on the TV. Read something in the newspaper. You're going to hear about an issue, and, and, and not because of what you read in the Bible, but so many people are, are changing their thoughts based upon what they hear some so-called evangelists talk about. I've heard people, or I've heard pastors, call people up out of the congregation, in front of the whole church, make a statement about them, declaring that they're going to receive a large sum of money in just a few short days, only for it to never come to pass like they said. I, I, I was listening to someone the other day, and they were trying to make some kind of a prophecy about some event that's going to take place here in America. And I was telling my wife this afternoon, people need to be careful when they say, I prophesy and say such and such is going to happen. Because all too often, people that claim to be prophetic in their ministry, and they advertise and they call themselves the prophet so-and-so or prophetess so-and-so or the apostle. You know, if it doesn't come to pass 100% the way that they said it's going to come pass, they're a false prophet. They're false prophet. When God makes a promise, when God says that he is going to do something, and if God reveals his message to an individual, 
God will do it and he will bring it to pass in his way, in his time, without our help. He will bring it to pass. Any other way is not of the truth. So you can protect yourself against the spiritual deception in this world. John chapter 16 verse 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And when you pray in the Spirit and you allow God to do a work in your life, he will keep bringing up the Word of God to your remembrance and to your knowledge, and it's the absolute truth. And when you get full of the Holy Ghost, he's going to reveal that truth, and you can know that truth because that truth will be a principle you can live your life by every day. You see, the absolute truth is found in Jesus Christ. There is no other truth. There is no other way. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We must stay as close to the source of truth as we can. Because if you draw near to Jesus, he will draw near to you. Some time ago when I was... Well, I say some time ago, it's been about 25 years ago, when I was still going to, to youth service, Brother Torn Johnson, who has preached here before, he was my youth pastor, and he used to instill in the teenagers' hearts in our youth ministry to, to get as close to God as we can possibly get. And he said, the only way that you can get as close to God is down at an altar of prayer. And the only way to make sure that you get to an altar of prayer, many of you have been in, in camp meeting services where it, it's so full and, and you try to make an effort to get to an altar, but as, as close as you can get to the altar is about halfway down the aisle and you can't get down to the front. Our youth pastor told us, he said, young people, that's no excuse. If you're hungry for God and you walk in the sanctuary with that mindset that you're hungry for God, you go ahead and get as close to that altar as you can before the altar call is given. And, and every Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night at our church, the young people, hundreds, a couple of hundred young people will be sitting on the front rows of that sanctuary. And when the altar call was given, it made no difference what it was for. The young people were hungry for God and they got up out of their seats and they got to the altar before anyone else did. Why? Because they were committed. They wanted a blessing. They wanted to seek first the kingdom of God. And so I encourage you, let's get as close to the altar. Let's set up front. Let's get involved in the service. The church service is not a spectator event, but the church service is a participator event. When someone sometimes shouts down the aisle, a lot of times we look like a calf looking at a new gate and we wonder, I've never seen that person shout before. Well, you shout with them. You shout along with them. You, you let God use you and do a work in your life. When people come to an altar of prayer, don't just wonder in your mind, well, I wonder what's going on in their life. No, you get up out of your seat. You come and you pray for them and you pray that God would do a work in their life. It takes every one of us working together, church. We're going to get through this situation that we face in our life from day to day. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because God be for us, nothing else can be against us. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 says, For this which cause, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You must hold on to the hand of Jesus Christ because he is the truth. Hold on to that truth because God's truth never changes. Because God never changes. Jesus never changes. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We must avoid false teachers. We must avoid those that claim to be a prophet and yet they're a false prophet. Just because they are popular, just because they have a large audience, just because they have written many best-selling books, just because they may pastor one of the largest churches in America, does not give you a legitimate reason to trust every word they say. Check to see if what they teach is found written in the Word of God. And if they are preaching anything, if one sentence in their material, if one sentence in their message, if one thing they say cannot be backed up by Scripture, 
All of their books, all of their publications only serve for one purpose, is to rekindle a fire in the fireplace. You must know the truth of God's word, and it is that truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth that will set us free from the things of this world. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about the subject of wars. Now we're seeing things take place today that I never dreamed of seeing. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 6 through 7, Jesus says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. In the past century, there has not been one single day without war somewhere on earth. Throughout the 20th century, it was a bloody century with over 160 million people killed around this world in wars. Since the year 1900, there's been over 115 wars fought around this world. Some of those wars took place in just a few days. Some of these wars took place over the course of several years. Some of these wars were global wars. We saw World War I from 1914 to 1918. 20 million lives were lost in World War I. And then we fast forward a few years to World War II from 1939 to 1945 that claimed over 55 million lives. And then we've seen the Korean War, the war in, in Vietnam, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, and the list goes on and on. And, 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 and it's, now, it's not showing any signs of becoming less despite mankind's efforts to try to bring about peace around this world. But I want us to understand the world as we know it today is never going to experience peace until we first of all come to know the one who is the Prince of Peace. Jesus warns that in the last days that we're going to see natural disasters. In Matthew 24, verse 7 and 8, he says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now when we're talking about the subject of disasters and we're talking about famines and earthquakes and, and things that we're seeing take place in our world today as we speak, we must be careful when it comes to discussing the frequencies of these events. For one thing, scientific ways of reporting these events have become more accurate than they used to be. So the question arises, are there more earthquakes now? Or is it perhaps that we're able to track them more and, and be able to see how often they are taking place? But I do believe that we are seeing an increase in disasters. We're seeing an increase in the turmoil. We're seeing an increase of hatred between nations of this world. We're seeing an increase between hatred within a nation. Like we are seeing in our nation today, a division between lawlessness and righteousness. In my lifetime so far, I have I've seen some things that have taken place. And in my hometown there at Van Buren, I've seen five tornadoes and two other storms just as intense that have impacted the city of Van Buren in the exact same location in over the last 30 years of time. I, I find it quite interesting to know that back in 1989 when I was in first grade, I remember it was of an evening. We had a terrible storm that was coming through and the electricity had already gone out. And I remember my mother was looking out the back window of the house and she said, y'all come and look at this and see what this is. And we went out there and we looked at the back of our, of our house, looked out the back window. We could see debris swirling up in the clouds going counterclockwise. And we knew then that, you know, this, this means the tornado's coming. So we got into the hallway and we began to pray. The storm began to dissipate as it got closer to our neighborhood. But then we fast forward into the year 1996. Another tornado swept through the exact same part of Van Buren, only this time it was much worse, destroying 375 houses, injuring several, killing nobody. That in itself was a miracle. But all of those houses that was destroyed in 1989 were also destroyed again in 1996. 
So we fast forward again, 2008. We have a, a large storm that comes through our town. Circular rotation that covers all of Fort Smith and Van Buren. If it would have dropped a tornado down, it would just have devastated Fort Smith and Van Buren. But instead of a tornado, we had a rotating supercell that produced 60 to 70 mile an hour winds and golf ball size hill. Almost every house in our town lost its windows on the west side. We was in a church service at the time. You could hear the, the storm, the hail beating on the roof. The, the young people were in the, off, in the, in the altars and, and God was doing a work in that service. But outside was just total destruction as that storm was moving through. And so I've noticed we've kind of got a pattern here. Every six to ten years, we've been facing a storm. So my wife and I, we got married in 2018, and, and uh, we were on our way to Branson for a work Christmas get-together. And as we were on our way out of town that day, the news reports were saying that uh, there was a chance of significant thunderstorms with an enhanced risk of tornadic activity. And I told my wife that night uh, on our way out of town that uh, the same scenario that I've told you that every five to ten years we see a terrible storm and I said maybe this is the night that Van Buren's going to get hit again it's been a while it's been ten years exactly and so as we were uh, out of town we were watching the news later that evening and we were watching on the weather channel a national news network and they began to say that they've reported 90 mile an hour winds just west of Fort Smith and Van Buren and I told Alyssa then I said you know it's terrible when Fort Smith and Van Buren makes national news. They never talk about us. We're too much in the backwoods, but it was, they were making a note of it on the national news. So I called my mother. I said, are, are y'all okay? There, there's a storm coming your way. They were already asleep. They didn't know anything was coming. And I told them what the news network was saying. 15, 20 minutes later, she calls back and it happened again. Van Buren had been hit by another tornado. Missed our house by a couple of blocks. It destroyed a mini storage complex behind my parents' house. Took out their fence. Did some damage to the house. And so we see things that are taking place more frequently. We see disasters. We see chaos around our nation. But I want us to understand something very serious about this. This is not the main event. It's not the main event. Yes, there's going to be wars. There's going to be famines. There's going to be disease. We're seeing the most chaotic situation going on with COVID-19 as, as thousands of people are being affected by this virus. But that's not the main event. The wars, the disasters is not the main event. Jesus said, it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning of sorrows. In other words, there's much more to come. If you think it's bad now, you have not seen anything yet. And as we get closer and we, we start talking about the tribulation period, you're going to understand that you are not going to want to be left behind on this earth when the tribulation period takes place, when God removes his retaining, restraining force from the powers of hell to come against this world in fury such as what this world has never experienced. We're seeing today taking place hatred and betrayal. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Now I find it quite interesting when I hear people tell me, or I read about all of their drama on Facebook, how they have been hurt, and how someone has done something wrong to them, and, and they're constantly talking about it, and they're focusing on that hurt. And the more they talk about that hurt, the more that they seem to hurt, and the more sympathy they want regarding their hurts. Do you know how many people I talk to that have ever been hurt by something that someone said or something someone said about them? Let me give you an interesting insight on this. Did you know that it is impossible to live your life without ever being hurt? It's impossible to live your life without going through some kind of a betrayal? The Bible makes it clear that all believers in Jesus Christ should expect trouble in their walk on this earth. Suffering for Jesus Christ is a real circumstance that has happened to Christians ever since the time of Jesus Christ. Did you know that in the late 1990s, two girls were killed in a Colorado high school just because they said they were a Christian? 
Since the time of Christ, over 70 million people have been killed for following Jesus Christ. And a lot of the killing of Christians that we see today is basically because of the hatred of the Muslims toward Christians. It's with all of the protesting that we see going on in our world today, the nonsense that's taking place. I was very disturbed when I saw one of the so-called peaceful protesters hold up a sign in front of a Fox News camera that says, When Jesus comes, we will kill him again. And church, that's why we must understand the circumstance that we're facing in this world. It's not a, it's not a, a battle on which race is more superior. It's not a battle on who's right and who's wrong, but it's a battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. A battle between the powers of hell and the powers of light. And we know the end result. Jesus said that he has conquered it all. He will reign victoriously as King of kings and Lord of lords. In the last days, we're going to see a change in churches. And we're seeing that change taking place today. I'm not talking about a change in the, in the methods of ministry. We've changed our methods here since I have been here as pastor. We've started putting our services on the internet. We, we sing different songs each week. You never know what, what our choir is going to sing. And, and we change our methods on how we proclaim the message. The message will never change. We still proclaim the same message. We still proclaim the same truth as it was in the beginning that, that Jesus is the way. But I'm talking about there are churches today that have compromised and they have changed and they have put away the truth of God's word and have traded genuine spirit-filled worship for entertainment. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 12 through 13, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I want you to listen to me carefully. I do not care what the Supreme Court says concerning what the church can and cannot do. The church, the, the Supreme Court is not going to force the church to do anything. Why? Because we answer to a higher authority. We answer to a higher supreme judge and, and, and we are not going to back down the truth of God's word. They can try to bring a lawsuit against us. They can try to shut us down if they want. But we're going to hold truth. We're going to hold on to the unchanging hand of Jesus Christ. And if God be for us, who can be against us? We're going to uphold the spiritual truth of the word of God. And church, while I'm on that subject, we are still... In the, uh, in, in the guidance and within the guidelines of the U.S. Constitution, which clearly says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. So when we take a stand on the biblical truth of the word of God, whether that stand is on missions, whether that stand is on relationships, whether that stand is on marriage, on sex, it makes no difference. If it's based upon the word of God, we're going to proclaim the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. In the last days, there's going to be a global awareness of Jesus Christ. We're seeing that take place today. All across social media, on television stations, on Facebook, everywhere you look, you see the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached. I remember back in the last part of March when we first uh, went to online-only services and I, I thought it was quite amazing. You go on Facebook and all of a sudden for the first time in church history, you have hundreds of churches live streaming all over Facebook. It clogged up the internet. We had terrible bandwidth sometimes because all of these churches were broadcasting in high definition. And we, we have tried so hard to try to do a lot of live streaming of our services here, but bandwidth will not allow it as of yet. And so we take our services and we, we broadcast them on YouTube. But Jesus has already said that in the last days, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached all around this world. We have missionaries that go all over this nation. We have missionaries that go from one continent to another. We have missionaries in Africa. And where we can't send missionaries, we have our, our, our broadcast that we send out on 
the internet. We have churches that send broadcasts out over television, on satellite. We're doing everything that we can to try to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. Why? Because he said when the gospel of the kingdom is preached to all nations as a witness for his namesake, then shall the end come. We're so close, church. Jesus Christ is coming soon. I believe the rapture of the church is going to be taking place very soon. In the assemblies of God, as is the case in most Protestant evangelical churches, we believe that before the tribulation takes place, the tribulation is the seven-year reign of the Antichrist. We believe that before that tribulation period takes place, that Jesus is going to take his followers, living and dead, to heaven through the rapture of the church. Now, I know there are critics of this belief to say, well, the word rapture is not found in the word of God and all you people want to do is just escape the tribulation. Well, yeah, wouldn't you? You better believe we want to escape the tribulation. I don't want to be here. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm not looking for the mark of the beast. I'm not looking to see who the Antichrist is. I want to see the Christ. I want to see Jesus Christ, the one who died for me. We believe that the resurrection of those believers who have died and in their translation into glory instantly, along with the believers that have been here and are still alive, we're going to be translated instantly in a moment in a twinkling of an eye from this place here on earth into heaven to be with Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 tells us, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There are preachers today, even in Pentecostal churches, that believe that Christians are going to go through the tribulation. That's not a blessed hope. That's a terrible dread. A blessed hope is not a tribulation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 52 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Jesus taught that he is going to come back to this earth. And he was careful to warn his disciples to be constantly prepared for his soon return. In Matthew 24, verse 42 through 51, he says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day, when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrite. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are churches today that are critical about us using the word rapture. And they say, well, rapture is not found anywhere in the word of God. I would also like to remind these same churches that also preach on the doctrine of Trinity that neither is the word Trinity found in the word of God, but yet we still proclaim it. Trinity simply means three that are one. It's found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Three that are one. Rapture means to be caught up. The word rapture is not found in the Bible, but the word caught up is. It means the same. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with 
with the Lord. Following the rapture of the church is going to come the awful dreaded seven years of tribulation. In Matthew 24, verse 15 through 22, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. He's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. There's going to be a new temple built in Jerusalem. It has not yet been built. But the Antichrist is going to stand in that temple and declare that he is the Messiah. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved for the elect's sake. Those days should be shortened. In verse 15, we see the, the, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. It's found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where he says, And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is talking about a seven-year period of time, a week of years. And in the midst of the week, after three and a half years of time, He's going to cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, he adds to this picture, he says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. As we see things that are taking place in our world, today. We should keep our focus upon Jesus Christ, who is the main event, not the tribulation, not the Antichrist, but Jesus Christ. I understand, church, Jesus Christ is coming soon, and we must be ready, for he could come at any moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, Father, for this promise of your soon return. And Lord, we know that very soon we're going to hear the trumpet of the Lord sound. And your word assures us that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the year. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And Father, I pray that in this sanctuary tonight, if there's someone here tonight that is not ready to meet you, Father, I pray that you would speak to their heart. Lord, that their life would be forever changed by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray for unsaved loved ones. God, we pray for those who have drifted away from the truth of your Word. God, that you would bring the convicting power of your Spirit upon them. Lord, that they may know the truth. That they may surrender to the truth of your Word. And come back home to you. And to live for you all the days of their life. Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to be watching. For we believe your coming is very soon. Help us to be ready. For your coming could be at any moment. Lord, we want to hear you say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We bless your name. We thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name. Can we stand together and sing this chorus as we worship together? Oh, what a day.
sanctuary tonight I want to do something that's a little different we did this about a year ago shortly after I became pastor and we're going to do it again tonight there are new people that's been attending our church since we last did this and so we we're going to do this again and if you have included these names last year you can do so again tonight because we're redoing our, our prayer list but every one of us in this room tonight we all have people that we would like to consider a prodigal. They once knew the truth of God's word, but they've drifted away. They've backslid. We also know some that have never come to know the truth of God's word. They've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so in the seat back in front of you, there are those connection cards or the visitor's cards. Whatever card you want to use or write it on an envelope. But on the back of that card, on that blank space, for the next few minutes, I want you to write down some names of your unsaved loved ones. Write down names of those that have backslidden in your family that you want to see come to know Jesus Christ. Write down names of anyone that you know that needs to come back home to live their life for Jesus Christ. Once you have that card filled out, I want you to come and bring that card and lay it on this altar up here. And we're going to pray over these names. We're going to anoint these cards with oil. And we're going to plead the blood of Jesus upon these individuals' lives. And over the course of the next several weeks and months, these names are going to be compiled into a list. And it's going to be turned in to our intercessory prayer team that meets here on Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock. And every Thursday at 10 o'clock, we're going to be calling out these names in prayer. And we're going to be pleading the blood of Jesus Christ upon the names of these individuals and believing that God is going to save their soul and fill them with the power of the Holy Spirit, set them free from the bondages of sin. So as you write those names and as you continue you and you conclude that list bring that list place it up here on the altar and we're going to pray over these names and we're going to agree and we're going to call upon the name of the Lord to bring salvation and life into their life in Jesus name oh what a day that will be oh when my Jesus I shall see
upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and he leads me through the promised land oh what a day what a glorious day Looking at this collection of lists, there is no doubt in my mind that there is over a hundred names that's been turned in. Have you ever stopped to think about church? When these people get saved, they're going to need a place to go to church at. Why not bring them here? Bring them here. The greatest church that I know here in LaFleur County, the greatest church I know around anywhere, here at Howe Assembly of God. We love souls. We love people. Is this still going on the internet? Can you get a close-up of these cards up here? Because we're going to put this on, on the YouTube. We're going to put this on Facebook to let people know that we are praying for them. I'm not going to mention these names. But some of you that are watching online, you never come to church, but your family comes to church here. And I want you to know we're praying for you. And every Thursday at 10 o'clock, we're going to be calling your name out in prayer. And we're going to ask God to touch your life and to strengthen you and to get you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is coming soon. We want to spend eternity with you in heaven. Those of you that's gathered up here at this front, if you want to come and gather around these names, I'm going to pray over these names. We're going to anoint each one of these cards with oil. And we're going to believe God for salvation in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we lift up these names to you, Father. Lord, every name that's on these lists, Father. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus Christ upon them tonight. In the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would strengthen them, Father. Lord, that their life would be changed forever by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let the convicting power of your Spirit, Father, go forward from this prayer service, God. Let the convicting power of your Spirit, Lord, draw the sinners, Father, to an altar of prayer. That their life would be changed, Father. That families would be reunited. That marriages, Father, would be healed. God, that the brokenness, Lord, would be mended, Father. Lord, that lost sons and daughters come to know you. Lord, they lost family members, Lord. We pray for husbands, Father. We pray for dads. We pray for grandmas and grandpas, Father. Lord, every family member, Father, we pray, God, that your anointing, Father, that your provision, Lord, would bring the Father to an altar of prayer. Oh, Lord, we know with you all things are possible. Lord, we call upon you, for Lord, you said in your word, call unto me, and I will answer thee. To you, we lift up every name to you, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father. We call the things that be not as though they are. Lord, by faith we believe, we receive in the name of Jesus, Lord, that the lost will come to know you, Lord, that their life would be changed forever, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, Lord. We're not going to be defeated, we're not going to be destroyed. The devil has had his hands on them for long enough, but it's time to say. Get thee behind thee, Satan. Get thee behind. For we know in whom we have believed. We're committed to go forward with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. Oh, hallelujah. Can we lift our hands and thank him that he has heard our prayer. He has heard our cry. Lord, we pray that you will bring salvation to these needs, Lord. Lord, that their life be changed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah to your name. Thank you for watching today. If we have reached you, we would like to hear from you. You can visit us online at howag.com. Or you can write to us at First Assembly of God, P.O. Box 97, Howe, Oklahoma, 74940. We invite you to worship with us at First Assembly of God, Sunday morning Sunday school at 930, morning worship at 1040, Sunday evenings at 6, and Wednesday evenings at 7. 
We also invite you to subscribe to our online YouTube channel or visit our Facebook page. We hope that you can join us again soon for another service from First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.